Good morning. We are coming back to the book of Acts and continuing our journey through the book of Acts. And today we're going to be picking up at the end of chapter four. You'll recall that you know, a lot of things have happened beyond the day of Pentecost. Peter and John have been hauled before the Sanhedrin, spent a night in prison. Uh, you know, they've boldly spoken to them about who Christ is and that they could not stop obeying him rather than obeying the Sanhedrin. And then they've come back to the community and the people have prayed for them. And the Spirit of God has moved powerfully once again. And then our passage of scripture that we're studying today picks up with another kind of uh, description of what the community is like. What's going on together as these people are becoming the first church, the first group of believers together in Jerusalem. And so we're going to read from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. It says, All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them, all that there, uh, in them all, that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Here we have this description of a growing community of believers who are responding to the apostles' teaching, to their testimony about the resurrection of Jesus. And I'm sure there were many other lessons and things that they were hearing from their three years that the disciples had spent with Jesus, and especially in those 40 days after the resurrection until his ascension, when you know, they were hearing the gospel, the truth. And it had a huge impact. Now in the church today and over the centuries that have passed, we sometimes tend to compare our experience of church today to the early church. Uh, what we saw in those first believers, and sometimes there's a real discrepancy. And you know, for the people at Radiant, that was one of the foundational thought processes that you were going through as a group of uh, young adults looking at the book of Acts and going, well, church doesn't quite look like that. And so we often want to go back and, you know, kind of capture that and see if we can't experience the same thing. And so we really have to also look back to Acts chapter 2, where there is the first description of believers on Pentecost and their response uh, to the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we've looked at this earlier in Acts 2, 42 to 47. We read this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, when we compare these two passages of Scripture that are describing, you know, the early church, there's, there's a number of common themes that I think we see in both passages. And the first theme is this sense of commitment, this sense of devotion, of unity of heart and mind. They seem to be all in on following Jesus. And sometimes we may get thinking that, you know, they gave up everything in their lives to be Christians, to be followers of Jesus. But I think if we think about it, we'll go, well, that's not the case. The, you know, they still had to go about their ordinary lives. They still had jobs, responsibility, and families to care for, 
Um, and so the carpenters probably continued to be carpenters and doing their work. The, 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 the housewives continued to be housewives and looking after children. And children may still have been playing and going to school, but there was something added to their lives something quite different. And there was this sense of commitment, of priority that was placed on being followers of Jesus, but not giving up everything else that they are and who they were. The apostles continued to do their thing, teaching and testifying to the resurrection of Jesus. That was an integral part of what was continuing to be part of their fellowship. And God was continuing to do his thing as well. Signs and wonders performed through the apostles. Ongoing. They were spending time together, not only at the temple, at church, at the, the place where we normally go to worship, but they were spending together time together in their homes as well. It wasn't just this, let's meet for church. This was, we're essentially living life together. They were sharing what they had with one another, and they even sold property and possessions to provide for those who had needs. Excuse me for a second. <clears throat> I have to apologize. Even, even when I'm preaching, I find it really hard not to sing <laughs> all, all the songs that we're worshiping. Um, and so that does a little damage to your voice before you get up to speak. So uh, bear with me. Now, it's not only Christians that look to this type of community and find it attractive. Not just Christians. And there's many people that have tried to copy it, at least the communal living part. Isn't that the case? We even have political systems like socialism and communism that are built around this idea of the common good for all. At times, people have created smaller communes coming together to try and recreate what they have seen and read about in the book of Acts. And here they're, they're trying to capture the end result of what God had been doing. They were trying to recreate community and what it looked like. And all the wonderful experiences that are, seem to be shared in these words. But they tend to ignore the foundation on which that community was built. They're creating a facade of what God had done. And here's the key component that is missing and often missing in some of the efforts that we make within the church when we try to create something on our own because it looks like a good idea, or this is what we think the church should be. And it's these words from our passage of scripture. God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. God's grace was powerfully at work in them all. The life of the early church and the believers flows out of the power of the Holy Spirit working in their lives individually and collectively. Now, we, we can try to create the facade of what it looks like to have God working in our lives. We, we've created our kind of own rules about what a good Christian looks like. They go to church, right? They bring their Bible. Maybe you bring your phone now, right? Um, but you've got a good app. And we, we have a tendency to do this. We've, we've created, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and you know, and, you know we, we had good Baptist rules, right? You know, you don't go to movies, you don't dance, you know, you don't date girls that do, you know, all those kind of things, right? We, we, we fall into this trap of trying to create the church rather than depending on the power of the Spirit of God. And so we have something that sometimes looks like what we think God would have us do, but we really need to be living in the power of God's grace 
and letting the life of Christ flow through us so that it'll impact those around us as well. That is the message of Acts. That's the message of the church. And so what follows this description again is uh, a life of the early church are two examples that provide us with very contrasting pictures of living in the power of the Holy Spirit and trying to make it look like you are. The example we read is about Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. What do we know about this man? Why, why out of 5,000 men that were now part of the church, not counting women and children, why out of 5,000 men is Barnabas an example? Well, I'd like to suggest it because he was a man with a reputation and a well-earned nickname. It wasn't because he actually sold the property and brought the money to Jesus, to the apostles and set it at their feet. No, I think it was something different. And so when we don't have a lot of information here, but what we do know is that he wasn't a native of Jerusalem. He wasn't a, an insider to the community in Jerusalem, but was from Cyprus. Now, whether he was one of those people on the day of Pentecost that had come from afar and saw the spirit come in power on the day of Pentecost, or whether he'd been there earlier and been part of the community for some time. People knew him. People knew him. He was a Levite. He was a member of the priesthood in Israel. But he was known as an encourager. An encourager even before he sold a piece of property that he owned and gave the money to the apostles. When I, when I think of someone as an encourager, what, do you, what, what, what comes to your mind? To me, it's, it's character, right? And it might have been how he spoke and how he acted, not only in his function as a, a priest, as a Levite, but just as being part of this community. And here he was known as a son of encouragement. And as we read later in Acts, we'll see that he becomes a leader in the expansion of the church, working with Paul and others. And this is the person that God gives us as an example. Of someone that's part of this community actually takes a piece of land he owned, sells it, and brings the money to the apostles to be used to help people in need. Well, you ask, you know, who's the other example because we didn't get to that in our scripture reading. But if you flip to chapter 5, we get to this really well-known story about a husband and wife team. Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira. And so in chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, we read this. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. They did the thing, right? They did the thing that everybody in the church was doing. We're willing to sell our piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, though, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Still generous, isn't it? And, and we don't know how much, what percentage of what he kept for himself or what percentage he brought to God, but you know, it seems to us to be generous. And then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? To, to me, that kind of says like Peter knew you kept some of the money and probably not the majority of it, probably just a minor piece of it you kept. And he asked them these really important questions. Didn't it belong, and they're rhetorical, aren't they? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? I mean, the property was yours. And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? It was yours to do whatever you wanted to do with it. <clears throat> 
What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. And I take from this passage that what Peter's saying is that you've, you've put on the impression that you're giving it all. I've sold my property and I'm giving it all to God. But held back. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Pretty serious consequences. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. And then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. I don't know about you, but I'm, I can think of many times in my life where I've kind of pretended to God, right? God, God I, I'm, I'm giving you everything, but then you realize there's so many things I'm holding back. So many things I'm holding back. I'm, I'm glad I haven't suffered the same consequences. Um, about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. I guess it's a little busier community than we think. You know, my wife kind of knows everything that I get into. So I, you know, even though we have two cars and go separate ways all kinds of times, there's this sense, you know, the husband and wives, we kind of know what the other person's up to, right? What's troubling them or what they're doing. But here she was about three hours later, she comes in not knowing what had happened. And Peter asked her, tell me if this is the price you and Ananias got for the land. Here's your opportunity to confirm, is this really the truth? Did you get $100 instead of 120 Yes, she said, that is the price. And Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. Not good news. And at the moment, she fell down at his feet and died. And then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. So what do we learn from these two examples? What, what, what do we learn? Why, why do you think... Luke added these two examples into this description of what was going on in the life of the church. Let me suggest a few things. The first thing is we really have to recognize that there's no specific demand to sell the property and give the money to meet the needs of others. To be part of the community doesn't mean that you know, if you've got property, even if it's excess, doesn't mean you have to sell it to be part of the community. God, God's given it to you. He's blessed you with it. He's, you know, provided for you and for your family and, and for others. And, and God doesn't demand that you just give it all up. But there is a demand for Honesty. There's, there's a demand for honesty with God, certainly. That becomes very clear when he talks about lying to the Holy Spirit. But there's also a demand for honesty with others. To being truthful with each other. But there's also a demand to have honesty with ourselves. You can't fool God and you can't really fool yourself. You might think you can, but you really can't fool yourself. And experiencing and, experiencing and living in the power of God's grace is really the key to life. Here Ananias and Sapphira thought, you know, the, the right thing to do is to sell our property and, and serve the needy. But they, but they kind of made a, a mockery of that. 
because they lied to God and lied to the others and lied to themselves about, yes, this is all we have and we're giving it away. Again, I think for us today, there's, there's this, hmm, how do I treat the grace of God that I've received? Can I just find myself following some rules that I think apply? Some boxes that I can check off that make me feel good about, okay, yeah, I'm donating to the church or I'm going out and serving at Ray of Hope and, and, or I'm going out and I'm doing this. And, and checking them off because there's something to do. There's something we think God will, would want us to do. There's, you know, we feel an obligation somehow. And so we look for things to check off our list to make us feel good about where we would stand before God. And it's so far from living in the spirit and living in the knowledge of God's grace and how generous a God he has been. And so sometimes, sometimes we let this attitude of scarcity that I, I need my own time, I need my own protection, I need my stuff for me as opposed to what does God want to give me and what does he want to do through me. Paul provides us with this wonderful description of how God's grace works to our benefit and through us to the benefit of others. It's a really familiar passage in Ephesians 2, 4 to 10. Paul was writing these words to that church and to us. He said, but because of his great love for us, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Talk about a transition. In order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God's expression of love and abounding grace being kind to us through Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And when we get that out of sync and start to do things backwards, when we just start to do good works, just for them, the sake of doing them, when they get detached from the source of God's love, and grace in our lives, and God working in our lives, us being turned into his handiwork, we really miss the power of God being at work. Later in Ephesians, he adds this additional comment about grace, and this is Ephesians 4, verse 7. He says, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. does that mean? Grace has been given as Christ apportioned it to each one of us. Well, God's grace is expressed universally in the gift of salvation that we all can receive. There's this, you know, that's a universal truth that the apostles have been teaching and preaching to people. 
the resurrection of Jesus and how that is God's expression of love to us. But here he's seeming to indicate that God's grace is also expressed to us individually. That God knows who we are and what we need and provides each of us with the grace for every situation. The gifts of the Spirit are an individual expression of God's love for us that gifts us and empowers us. God's grace in our lives will be just demonstrated by the, the good works that flow out of our knowledge and experience of his love. Peter also reflects these similar thoughts on grace. In 1 Peter 4, 7 to 11, we read this. The end of all things is near. And sometimes because we look at that and, and we go, okay, that was written over 2,000 years ago. And, well, the end really wasn't near for them. And we start to question, well, was, is the end near for us? We have to realize that, you know, God doesn't work within our time-space continuums around doing things quickly or taking a long time to do something. But for us, the end of all things is near. God is going to bring his purposes to conclusion. And so Peter writes to people and says this to them, therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. So that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply. Love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Love allows us to go and say, I'm sorry. Love allows us to go and say, you've hurt me. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And that's kind of the, well, they invited us for dinner, so I guess we have to invite them over for dinner, but they're probably going to bring their kids and then they'll run around the house and then who knows, something will get broken, so maybe we can meet them at Swiss Chalet. You've ever had those thoughts? <laughs> Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. And believe me, when you have the responsibility of stepping up here on a Sunday morning to try and share God's words with people, you take that very seriously. You, you don't need to hear my words and my thoughts. Anyone I've ever dealt with that does any kind of speaking or preaching in a church or other places always wants people to hear the words of God as they're being shared, as the scriptures are being opened and we're asking the spirit of God to speak to us from his word. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Now I think the key phrase in this little passage are these words. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Stewardship isn't something we talk about very often in everyday language, but when you go to the dictionary and go, you know, what's steward mean? There's a, a variety of things, but the main thought is this, one employed in a large household or estate to manage domestic concerns. Isn't that a beautiful picture of our responsibility to God? Here God has called each of us into his family, into the church, 
and he's loved us through his grace. He's provided us with all his limitless resources to share with others. And so when Peter is and Paul are, are writing in the scriptures and writing letters to people, almost every introduction of those books, those letters start with this type of phrase. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It's not what do I have to offer you? Because I'm pretty limited as a person. I only have so much. And in comparison to the incomparable riches of God's grace... There's no comparison. So God has called each of us into his family, the church. He's loved us with this incomparable grace and provided us with these limitless resources to share with others. Not my resources, but his resources. We're on this journey together as grace and radiant and no, we're, we're tempted to try and manufacture the kind of church we think God wants us to be. Now, I've got a business degree and worked in management in a company, and I fall into this pattern so easily of, I can see what we should be. I can see where I think we should go. And I'm sure many of you have had those same thoughts over these months as we've had these discussions. We, we may have a picture in our minds of what this should look like in a few months or a year or two years or five years down the road. And, and we're defining a process that we, we think us will take us to where we want to be. But this journey will only be successful if we are being faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. My, our hearts have to be open to experiencing God's grace in our lives and living in the power of the Holy Spirit. And out of that abundance, letting Jesus live through me and to the benefit of others. And that's my prayer for us as we continue to move forward, that we would be focusing on Jesus, experiencing his grace in our lives. And through that, sharing it with each other and to our community. Let's pray. Father, we would pray that you would continue to move in power as your spirit did in the early church. Might we be sensitive to your spirit's leading, drawing us deeper into fellowship with you and with each other. Lord, we want to be the instruments of your grace. And so, Father, we would pray that you would fill us with your spirit. Might your spirit flow through us and do the work that only he can do in the hearts and lives of people. The people that you love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.